Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of the Fantasy Pros Dynasty Football Podcast. I am Ryan Warmly, joined by my good friends, Pat Fitzmorris and Scott Bogman. Fellas, today we are talking about some Dynasty rookies. We will be going through every position, talking about some of the biggest names, the guys at the tops of those rookie rankings. We'll work our way down the list a bit, see how many names we can hit here in the next hour. We are, of course, coming off. The Super Bowl is done. The Chiefs are a dynasty. Three Super Bowls in five years. So now that we're past the Super Bowl, it is time to think about our dynasty drafts. We're past the Senior Bowl as well. We are just a few days, several days away from the Combine and, of course, a couple months away from the NFL Draft. Bogman, I want to ask you, before we dive into these rookies, at this point in the year, what is your process like for evaluating rookies? Are you still kind of weighing heavily, obviously, all the tape over their years in college? Are you thinking about some of the rumors that have been coming out now that they're eligible for the draft this year? Are you th- looking at reports from the Senior Bowl, thinking ahead to the Combine, thinking ahead to potential landing spots? What kind of goes into that formula for you at this time of year? Yeah, a lot of that. Uh, obviously, uh, just re-watching, making sure I have a good base, listening to, uh, I'm absorbing a lot of information right now. I'm watching a lot of uh, podcasts, reading a lot of articles, uh, doing uh, all kinds of due diligence, you know, looking at the the film again. There's a great, somebody has put out uh, just a, an amazing uh, cut up of like every prospect out there. So I'm going to that Google page a bunch, watching these. I'm double checking stats. I'm looking at team needs. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, I think I have pretty much for the guys that I've watched fully, I feel like my opinion is not going to be changed too much. Maybe a little bit by measurements from the combine, right? Pro days, I do not care about at all. Like all those numbers are made up. Uh, you know, they're all, you know, got the thumb on the scale a little bit for uh, the times and all that stuff. It's that's, you know, I don't know. It, it's I, I don't take any information from there seriously. So for me, the combine is kind of the last thing. RAS scores, things like that uh, for the guys that test. We're getting more guys to sit out test now. And a lot of teams are ditching some of those like uh, the Rams. We talked about that last week. The Rams are. Uh, ditching straight line speed and then looking at like the GPS tracker or the all the speed trackers and everything from Zebra at uh, the Senior Bowl. So, um, you know, th- there are little things that will change here and there. But I think for the most part, I'm I'm pretty locked in on the guys that I've fully broken down. I haven't got to everyone yet. I just did my fantasy baseball rankings, 300 guys there. So I'm uh, hopping back on and um, getting everything set for, uh, you know, for the draft and all that stuff right now, right before the combine. Yeah, I feel like Zach Wilson's unbelievable throw at his pro day should just like end pro days mattering for everybody. <laughs> if he can do that and then be what he's been in the NFL, that's uh, that's, that's uh, not a great sign for how much those should be valued. Fitz, what about you? What's going into your calculus this time of year? Oh, boy. Um, prospect cut-ups, scouting reports, uh, mainlining draft podcasts, um, pretty much all that, you know, on top of – a lot of past college football watching. And while I do not watch as much college football as Mr. Bogman here, uh, you know, like I think for the most part, I've seen at least a little bit of most of the top prospects. Like there are a few guys who've kind of fallen under the radar. And there are some guys like go to smaller schools like Malachi Corley, Western Kentucky. Although I did happen to see Western Kentucky play Ohio State this mm-hmm. past fall and Malachi Corley had Corley a pretty good game. game. Yeah. yeah. So um like I, I feel like I already have I have at least a little bit of an idea of what all of these guys are about, but things are still, uh, you know, coagulating in my head, I guess, and will be for the next month. And I'm, I'm definitely anxious to get the, the data points of the combine. Like, yeah, I, to, to Fitz's point, like mm-hmm. I haven't watched, I know Kamani Vidal right now is raising up a lot of boards and you see his stats and everything. I think I've, I've seen him once or twice. That's a guy I need to go back and do a deeper dive on, you know, uh, smaller school guys, things like that. Uh, but yeah. for the most part, like, like Fitz said, if you watch these guys, maybe watching some of the cutups will change your opinion a little bit. Um, but you know, uh, we, we've seen a lot of of what's available at this right. point. Other than other than bowl season, you're not going to get to watch Troy 
very often. Right, right. Yeah. All right, let's dive into this rookie class of 2024. Just a quick note, all of our early 2024 consensus rankings and tiers can be found at fantasypros.com slash rankings. From there, you can also navigate to our staff rookie rankings on the site as well. We will start with the quarterbacks. The first three names I want to talk about are the three names that very well may be the first three names drafted in the NFL draft in April, probably should be the first three names drafted in April, given the value of the position. That is Caleb Williams, Drake May, and Jaden Daniels. Now, Caleb Williams may not be QB1 on 100% of big boards, but he is the clear consensus. Our our, uh, Debro actually disagrees with that right now. You can check out the NFL Draft Show to see why he disagrees with that. But Caleb Williams is the consensus guy. So Fitz, what is it about Caleb Williams that makes him the obvious number one pick in rookie Superflex drafts? I think arm talent and the ability to make plays off script. Like, that's the thing. When the play breaks down, Caleb Williams is really dangerous, a la Patrick Mahomes. And y- you can see flashes of that and how that's going to translate really well to the NFL. Um, but it's not like he can't win from the pocket either. I think he does a lot of that. So, And the fact that he's now done it for a couple of years, and maybe some people saw this past season as a letdown, uh, they kind of asked him to, to walk on water this past season because USC's defense went to seed completely and he was having to win shootouts week after week. Couldn't always do it, but I don't think that should be a knock on him. I mean, I, I absolutely think he should be number one in this class. Bogman Fitz said the name Patrick Mahomes. I was going to ask you that comparison has been thrown around. Obviously, he looked very Mahomes-esque two years ago when he won that Heisman. Fitz alluded to the tough season this year, tough being in air quotes there. What do you make of that comparison, Box? I mean, it's accurate, and I. Um, no one is Patrick Mahomes, so let's just put that out there. Nobody's Pat. If anybody else is Patrick Mahomes, we'd have the Chiefs wouldn't have those three titles, right? So, um, but he is the closest coming into the NFL um, that we've seen since Patrick Mahomes, and um, you know, if he's not successful, it's it will be because you know he goes off script too much. He doesn't have a plan downfield, and I would assume you know, the rumors of immaturity would crop up somewhere because, uh, you know, any issues that he has are fixable, but he has every arm angle. He escapes routinely. He keeps his eyes downfield. He has an enormous arm. He has everything that you want from a starter. So, um, I, yeah, he's number one on my board, and I don't see that changing. Assuming he lands in Chicago, and let's say they add another receiver, you know, to pair with DJ Moore. Maybe it's with the ninth pick. Maybe it's in Roma free agency. Dunes, nine. Yeah, may, may, maybe it is a dude. Let, let, let's say it is, just for the sake of mm. argument. Where would Caleb Williams, going into the Bears offense with DJ Moore and Roma Dunze, where would he be ranked amongst dynasty quarterbacks overall, not just rookies, Bogman? Yeah, that is... Hmm, I, f- hi, probably five. Five or six. Man, I mean, five. he would be... There's so many good young quarterbacks right now, though, in the league already. There are, but uh, he is that type of prospect. He really is. And I don't know that Drake May and Jane Daniels are that much further behind him, but he would have to be very high. Is is May your QB2? We'll dive into him deeper in a second, but is he your mm-hmm. QB2, Bogman? I know he, he's he for is. Fits. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, he is in terms of where he's going to go in the draft. For fantasy, I might put Jaden ahead of okay. all, you know, Everybody here, depending on his landing spot and where he goes, because if he ends up in Washington and Cliff Kingsbury, you know, all they're going to do is pass. So uh, I'm that is who I would probably have as my number one fantasy quarterback for this season coming in if he does end up in Washington. But uh, yeah, Drake May is my two. And I just like I was kind of hemming and hawing. So I went back and rewatched it. Drake May is a star. Stud. He can make every throw. He has running ability. He can escape. He keeps his eyes downfield. And I saw, like, I think I saw him throw five interceptions. I think four were not his fault. One was just a bad throw. One he got hit on. Two bounced off the receiver's hands. One, um, I mean, maybe the other one was his fault, but I know three of them at least were not his fault. And I was like, good Lord, this guy is good. So all three of those guys are upper echelon talent, and um, they're going to be very high in my overall quarterback rankings once they get drafted. Fitz, would you say Drake May is closer to Caleb Williams at one or closer to Jaden Daniels at three in your personal rankings? Closer to Jaden Daniels at three. And like I have had to, there have been enough people singing the praises of Jaden Daniels where I've had to reconsider my position on that, but I I still have Drake may ahead of him for fantasy and just in terms of real life. Um, 
I, I guess it's because it's easy for me to watch Drake May and see that translate in the NFL. And Boggs just mentioned everything about that. And yes, uh, he, he did have a ton of drops. I think he had like 22 dropped passes on him last fall or something like that. It was kind of obscene. Um, Drake May's average depth of target, I think, was one of the deepest of this year's quarterback prospects, like 11 yards. And to, to Boggs' point about May keeping his eyes downfield, that's what I love about him. Like he is looking to make plays downfield. And a lot of times when he escapes the pocket, he's not doing it just to like run right away. He's still looking for receivers to break open and and make a play. Um, Gene Daniels, I don't know. It just bothers me that I can't. He puts up these freakish numbers in the SEC in the toughest conference in the nation. Um, the 40 to four touchdown interception ratio, the, the, gaudy rushing totals the great passing numbers but i just don't like i don't know if i can picture it in the nfl like how that's going to work you know what i mean it's um a little bit lamar like lamar jackson i i wasn't quite sure how that was going to work because you knew he was a great runner but what's it going to look like for lamar jackson as a passer i kind of get that same feeling about Jaden daniels even though his passing stats were fantastic having two great receivers didn't hurt a bit one year yeah. wonder too. I mean, he was okay at ASU, but yeah. his only huge year was last year. Well, what a so. year, though! I mean, it's yeah, I mean, amazing about year. As amazing. dominant a fantasy as been... college fantasy as you can have. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, Re- really, really remarkable. Uh, Fitz, before we move off this top three, how many of them will be in your top fifteen dynasty quarterback rankings after the draft? <sighs> it's a good question. Right now, I mean. It... I have Caleb about where Bogman has him, like five or six. Um, And I think I had May at like 15 and Daniels at like 17 or 18. So two. two. Impressive. Yeah, just two, but but right around that same range. So maybe if the landing spot suddenly looks a lot better than we expect. Like Daniels falls for some reason to Atlanta and he has all those weapons around him. Something like that maybe maybe bumps up a bit. Uh, Let's move to the next group of three quarterbacks here. Uh, These are not in an exact order. It's just kind of roughly where these guys are grouped. And there seems to be a clear gap between the top three and the next three. Next three are Michael Penix Jr., J.J. McCarthy, Bo Nix. If you guys want to hit on Penix or Nix, we can. The guy that's most intriguing to me is McCarthy. He's a guy that, again, to shout out Debro and Thor's new NFL draft show, they are both very high on McCarthy. I know Thor would love to see him in Minnesota. I know Debro has him ranked ridiculously high. He's the guy that there seems to be the most helium around potentially being a first-round pick in the NFL draft, maybe even a top-10 pick coming off the senior bowl. Penix and Knicks maybe had some of that steam coming away without having their best performances there. So Fitz, I'll start with you. With McCarthy specifically, obviously as a Big Ten guy, we watched a lot of him when he was at Michigan. He's a tough guy to evaluate. What do you, what do you make of him for fantasy purposes? He is tough to evaluate Worm, because we didn't see him throw a lot. And, uh, you know, Michigan had a very healthy running game with Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards. So, like, you don't have to throw all that much. And plus, Michigan was usually squashing their opponents. So, uh, run-friendly game scripts, to say the least. But, like, J.J. McCarthy does look like when the team gets off the bus – you can pick out the quarterback, like the the big strapping guy. Um, like he's mobile. He does have a really strong arm and and make some you know oh man type throws like every game. Um, so yeah, like I buy it, and there is a lot of steam about him moving up. And now I think it's pretty clear he's going to be the fourth quarterback taken in the draft. Bogman, is that what it should be? Should McCarthy be the fourth quarterback taken? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I like Penix a lot too. Um, I would love to see Penix in Minnesota, to be honest with you. Like, I just think that fit would work perfect with Kevin O'Connell. You get a guy that wants to sit back and throw the ball. They don't like to run the ball. Um, that's exactly the type of offense they ran in Washington, uh, under Kalen DeBoer for Penix. So I would like to see him in his, in a good landing spot, but that's not guaranteed. There's so many QB desperate teams. You have no idea where these guys are going to end up. I mean, you know, Right now, it seems like everyone is putting McCarthy in Denver, but Sean Payton doesn't really like rookie quarterbacks, right? So um, he needs a quarterback. Uh, Russell's going to be gone. So I just, and like Fitz said, and you said too, Worm, it's harder to evaluate a guy when they're running the ball 50 times a game and only letting him throw, you know, 15 to 20 passes tops. And that's what the blueprint was for Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. So uh, what we've seen, we like, but we've seen so much more of the other quarterbacks. They're just safer evaluations. 
If McCarthy's a top 20 pick in the NFL draft, will he be a first round pick in rookie super flex drafts? Because there's it is a really strong class for receivers. There's so many guys you make the argument for. Obviously, the other three <laughs> quarterbacks going ahead of him. Obviously, Brock Bowers, maybe a running back sneaks in there. Is there room for him in the first round of super flex drafts if he's taken highly enough in the NFL draft, Bogman? I think he has to be, right? And I think the reason is is because what that says about this QB prospect. Because Sam Darnold was still out there getting shots until last year, until this year, really. Last year, he was getting shots, right? So if you're picked in that top 20, almost all uh, – Mitchell Trubisky got extra shots, right? Like, you can look miserable in one scenario. And there are still going to be teams that go, well, he's a first-round pick. There's a lot of talent there. Let's bring him in and see if we can fix him. So, you know, even if he flames out real fast wherever he ends up, he will most likely get another shot, and those guys just last longer. And in a super flex, they're worth more. So they're worth more than a third wide receiver or a second running back or whatever, so they have to be first-round picks, in my opinion, for the most part. I mean, this is front-loaded with talent, this draft, so it's tough to say yes, but still yes Fitz same question I mean let, let's say he goes to whatever you determine is the best landing spot for me it's probably Atlanta top 10 draft capital there's tons of weapons there or I'm really excited to see Zach Robinson's offense so let's say he goes there or whatever your favorite landing spot is is he going to get drafted in rookie drafts ahead of like Malik Neighbors, Brock Bowers, or is he maybe more in that like back half of the first round, still behind the elite, you know, Roma Dunzes of the world, but ahead of sort of the second tier at those positions? Behind those pass catchers you mentioned, ahead of every single running back, and probably back. right around where like Keon Coleman and Xavier Worthy are going, like 108 or so. And uh, you know, by the way, if if uh, our listeners here want to check that out and, and run their own rookie mock drafts. You mm. can do that on the Fantasy Pros Mock Draft Simulator. Go to fantasypros.com slash simulator. And not only can you do redraft mock drafts, you can do dynasty startup mock drafts. You can do dynasty rookie mock drafts. And uh, I, I might have had something to do with the uh, the intel on uh, where guys are going at certain points in the rookie mocks. So, um, yeah. Give it a shot we, and, and see for yourself if you can get J.J. McCarthy at, at 110 or 111. Maybe, maybe not. We got the word earlier today that that rookie simulator had gone live, and I have already done a few of those because it's super mm. fun to play around with that tool, especially this time. As soon as the Super Bowl ends, it's just all rookie season for the next couple of months, and it's super, super fun. Just quickly to wrap up the quarterbacks, Spencer Rattler, Michael Pratt, Joe Milton. Is there anything of note on any of these guys? Obviously, Rattler is a guy that in the past was considered a potential number one pick. Clearly has not panned out that way you know, throughout the rest of his college career. But Bogman, any quick thoughts on any of those three? Oh, you're gonna make me praise Spencer <laughs> Rattler here. I don't like it. Uh, look, I'm I wasn't the biggest Rattler fan, but he really improved this year. And um, the one thing I'll say for him, he can make every throw. A little cowardly with the ball. Uh, I, I feel like um, he threw so many picks to start. Kind of didn't want to do it this season. So there's just a couple games I was watching. Maybe I bet him to throw a pick and he didn't throw one. But also they were down, right? And I'm like, throw the ball deep. He wouldn't do it. He's taking the safe throws. So I think that is fixable. So I think a lot of the stuff with Spencer Rattler was attitude to start plus he just, Caleb Williams was behind him. So he got pushed out of his starting job. He transferred to South Carolina, which, you know, South Carolina is fine. But I, I think – he he lost maybe too much steam, and then he won MVP of uh, the Senior Bowl, and he had a great week there too. So I think the helium is pretty high on him. I don't I don't know that he'll push against like Bo Nix, but I think he'll be quickly after Bo Nix, and I do think Bo Nix is a end of the first round, second round uh, type of a pick in the NFL draft. And remember, if a team is going to take a risk on a quarterback. You want to take him in the first round to get that extra year uh, on, you know, on the contract, the ability to extend one more year if you are going to take a quarterback. So maybe someone trades up to the back end to get a Bo Nix and Rattler could be pushing that too. so many QB desperate teams in the NFL. I don't think they need to be up there in terms of talent. I think there are way better players than them on the board at that point, but it's the most important position in the NFL teams value way too much so i do think somebody weird is going to get pushed into the first i just think so 
That that is what happened with Lamar, the a team trading back into the back end of the mm-hmm. first to get that yeah, fifth your year. Team. When the Ravens took him with the 32nd pick in the 2018 draft. Uh, Fitz, you got 30 seconds if you wanted any of these three guys, Rattler, Pratt, Milton, <laughs> any interest mid, mid-round mid lottery ticket in rookie drafts? I want to see more of Pratt because I didn't watch a lot of Tulane football last fall, so I'm anxious to see him throughout the combine. And I, I really want to like Joe Milton because his arm is insane. Like, this guy might have the strongest arm of any quarterback on the planet. And that's including, you know, any of the Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, whoever. Like, his arm is silly. There is a video of him uh, throwing a ball at the Mannings passing camp that, I, I swear to God, he put this ball into orbit. <laughs> and um, Looked like but, that Michael Vick commercial from a couple but, of years ago. Exactly. But as Thor said, 20. he is Nuke Lelouch from Bull Durham, the Tim <laughs> Robbins character. You you don't know where the ball's going. Like, he, he throws the gas. But you don't know where it's going, so I might I might have to abandon my hope for Joe Milton. Plus, he's overaged. He's yeah. He what, might need he's to got some flags. What's yeah. what's the what's the phrase? He can throw a strawberry through a battleship or something. <laughs> um, I think Wink Martindale said that about Justin Herbert once. But yeah, just that the dude has the biggest arm. Uh, by now, most of you have probably heard of Reality Sports Online, the powerful fantasy sports platform where owners get to build and manage their fantasy team like an NFL general manager. But the question is, have you tried it? It's time to go see what all the buzz in the Dynasty community is about. Free agency, multi-year contracts, a rookie draft, multi-team trades, franchise tags, contract extensions, first-round rookie options, automated contract and salary cap functionality, and so so much more. Think it sounds complicated? It's not. The best thing about Reality Sports Online Fantasy Front Office is that it doesn't take any more time than a standard league. It just requires more strategy. Think you're among the fantasy elite? Well, this is the platform to test your mettle. Still not sure? You can test out your general manager skills for free in a mock free agency auction. If you like what you see, use the promo code FANTASYPROS to receive a 10% discount on your team or league today. That's promo code FANTASYPROS to receive a 10% discount on your team or league today. Fantasy just got real at realitysportsonline.com. Let's move to the wide receivers. Probably the most loaded position in this year's draft, at least the deepest quarterback, also loaded at the top as well. At this position, there's also a big three. And also at this position, there is a clear number one within that big three. Fitz, wax poetic about Marvin Harrison Jr., Oh my goodness! Um, his dad is a Hall of well, Hall of Fame caliber wide receiver who's probably going to be there someday. Uh, Marvin Harrison is bigger and faster and stronger than his dad, and um, seems every bit as skilled. Good route runner, uh, great at making catches outside the frame of his body. Acrobatic, competitive, uh, really tough after the catch. And didn't get great quarterbacking and still put up fantastic numbers this past season. Like Ohio State's quarterback situation was not great. Like it was not a soft landing after, um, you know, what they've had in recent years. So I, I think he's number one. And I know a lot of people have like Malik neighbors nipping at his heels. And we've heard these rumors that Harrison is not a unanimous number one among NFL scouts and scouting departments. I kind of think it'd be crazy not to have him number one because I like I don't know what else you could want in a wide receiver. It's one of those things like when Jamar Chase was at LSU, like you'd watch him play and it's like, okay, this guy can't miss. Injuries are the only thing that could stop this guy from becoming a star. I feel the exact same way about Marvin Harrison Jr. And I'm not sure I feel the same way about Malik Neighbors. Like I think he's terrific, but I, I – think Marvin Harrison is absolutely foolproof, and I don't know if I feel the same about neighbors. You you mentioned the sort of iffy quarterback play from Kyle McCord at Ohio State this past season. In that sense, is there a landing spot Harrison could go to that would make you rethink where you might rank him as a rookie in fantasy if he goes to, say, the Patriots think he's just too good to pass up. They don't take a quarterback, so he's playing with who knows who in New England next year. Is a situation like that enough to maybe knock him down a peg or two, uh, Fitz, or nothing no, could knock him not down? not for me, because it's dynasty and they have a long runway, and whatever team he goes to, even if the quarterback situation is bleak for 2024, there's time for his team to get the quarterback situation right, no matter where he goes. Bogman, looking at this group as a trio, is it 
a 1A, 1B, even 1C situation? Is it 1A, 1B, and 2? Is it 1 and then 2A, 2B? What's the separation between these three names of Harrison, Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze? To me, it's 1A, 1B, and 2. And um, I- I'm not... I still have Marvin as my number one, uh, but I am so much closer than Fitz is because Malik Neighbors is so good. And really, for me, what it is about Malik is his... He just, he's so fast everywhere in every facet of the game. He's fast in his breaks. He's fast with the ball in his hands. He's fast at stopping. He's fast at starting again. I mean, it is the crazy speed that he has in his footwork that you just don't see. I mean, it's Antonio Brownish, right? And um, he also, he makes more guys miss than Marvin. Um, the thing that Rome does better than both those guys is contested catches. So, but you can also say he's got more opportunities for contested catches because he doesn't get the separation that Malik and Marvin do. So, um, they're all very good. Marvin is amazing. I mean, and that's why I was shaking my head when you asked the question about, um, you know, do you knock him for his landing spot? I think there's very few wide receivers that are QB proof. I mean, we watched DeAndre Hopkins play with some bad QBs in Houston, right? It was like, you know, Yates and Schaub and all of those guys, and he's still a Hall of Famer. Um, you know, and, and playing in Tennessee with some bad quarterbacks, even old, he looks good as well. So I think Malik is that guy. I think Marvin is that guy. I don't know if Rome is. You know, uh, I think Rome is very, very good. And I know, I think Lance Zerline comped him to Larry Fitzgerald. I'm not there yet, but I understand what he's saying. Rome looks amazing. He is Doesn't really Daniel good. Jeremiah have him ahead of neighbors too? I think I think he his, might. Yeah, um, yeah th- there's a couple people. I mean, look, this is serious talent at the top of the wide receiver board. This is amazing talent. We don't have anyone at uh, running back that is sniffing like the top seven wide receivers. It is crazy. So yeah. there's tons of talent up here, all major talent. If you want to split hairs, if you want to say this guy's over that guy, I understand they're all awesome, but for me, it is hard, Marvin, Malik, and then uh, Rome. So, so let me follow up with a similar landing spot question. Let's say Odunze goes to the Chargers, which everybody agrees would be an awesome spot for any of these pass yes. catchers. And let's say Neighbors goes to like the Giants, who are saddled with Daniel Jones for another year or something like that. Would you be interested in Odunze over Neighbors in your rookie drafts, or it's kind of <clears> Neighbors <throat> no matter what? He's just that good. I think it's Neighbors no matter what for me. I just think the 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 difference is too big there. Uh, for me in terms of talent. Um, but it's not going to be, you know, when you get down to the granular and the yards and the catches and the points, it's not going to, it's going to be like a point a game or two points a game. It's not going to be that big of a difference, of course. So it's not the biggest egregious thing, but, but for me, I don't think so. I think it's still going to be Malik. Maybe I'll change my mind when we get there, but I don't think I will. So Fitz, you are obviously super high on Caleb Williams and now Marvin Harrison Jr. Is there any case to be made for Harrison ahead of Williams in Superflex rookie drafts? I was just in a Superflex mock and someone took Marvin Harrison 101. Uh, I personally couldn't do it. I'd I'd take Caleb um, 101 and, you know, uh, put it this way, Worm. I've got 101 in uh, in in our league in <laughs> yes, our he, fantasy pros D- and uh, deep rose 101 that he foolishly traded to you. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So uh, yeah, and that that pick. As much as I love Marvin Harrison, that pick is not going to be Marvin Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, what about what about the rest of these guys? So let's let's say because again, there's no running back that we're considering. Let's set Brock Bowers aside for a second. The top three quarterbacks and the top three wide receivers in a super flex rook, super flex rookie draft. How are you breaking them down? We're pretty sure that it's Caleb 1 and Marvin Harrison 2. Is Neighbors going ahead of those quarterbacks like May and Daniels? Are quarterbacks just too valuable where those guys are going to be the third and fourth pick? Is it going to alternate maybe like May, then Neighbors, then Daniels? Or do- How is that breaking down for you, Bogman? I think that it's going to be um, Caleb and Marvin 1-2 for the most part. And then... I, I think it's the quarterbacks. For me, I think I'll have the quarterbacks there just because, once again, the context of a super flex league. You yeah. know, it's math. There's 32 starting jobs, right? And there's really 28 starting jobs. Like every year, four spots are in a question or in flux or whatever. You know what I mean? So it's really less than 32. If you're in a 12 man league, not everybody can have three. So somebody's going to be sitting on four. Somebody's going to be sitting on one. And the, the, um, 
the value of those quarterbacks is just so much higher because they're so limited and everybody has to start too. So uh, I think in that case, I'm most likely going to go one, two, three, the quarterbacks, but I understand putting Marvin in there, even Malik and Rome, like the talent is high, high, high for all six of those guys. What do you think about that fits kind of that Caleb one, let's say Marvin two, what do three, four, five, six looks like, look like for you between the two quarterbacks and two receivers again, setting aside Bowers for the moment. <laughs> Drake May is going to be three for sure. And then I still have to make up my mind on Daniels where I would, whether I would slot him ahead of neighbors and Odunze or <laughs> behind, or maybe even, you know, driving a wedge. Th- this is not helpful and... to me because in that league you just referenced, I have the 104. So I was hoping you would make it clear <laughs> on if I should go neighbors or whichever quarterback is there. And you're not making it clear. Take the QB worm. I'll do it I think, for you. I, that's QB. where I'm leading. Obviously we'll see uh, how everything falls. Uh, just quickly uh, before we get off these three, just cause they're so, talented and are going to make, I think, a really early impact in the league. Uh, How many wide receivers are going to rank ahead of Harrison in Dynasty the moment he gets drafted? There's Justin Jefferson, there's Jamar Chase, there's CeeDee Lamb. Is that it? Are all three of those even going to be ranked ahead of him? Is he that good that he's going to be ahead of any of those guys? Fitz, how many wide receivers are ahead of Harrison for you? You you just named the three. I've got him four, one spot ahead of Amon Ross St. Brown. Bogman, same three. I might put him behind Amonra. Amonra is so good. Um, he's in that mix for sure. So th- he's either going to be three or four. Let's look at the next group of receivers. It's kind of a bigger group because it's not totally clear kind of who is going to go highest in the NFL draft, who should be highest in your rookie drafts. Some of the names, though, Keon Coleman, Brian Thomas, also at LSU, Troy Franklin, I like him a lot, Xavier Worthy, I know Bogman likes him, Lad McConkey, Adonai Mitchell, also a guy Bogman will like. You'll notice the pattern there. <laughs> uh, so of that group of six, Coleman, Thomas, Franklin, Worthy, McConkey, and Mitchell, Bogman, who stands out to you as the guy that might end up being the best value in rookie drafts uh best value um probably worthy i think worthy is going to slip a little bit maybe not maybe i'm underrating him um i don't know because i'm insane i look at him and i see tyreek hill light right that's crazy uh, uh there are way better comps for him but he is a guy that i think his ceiling is so enormous because he's so fast i think everything you wanted out of marquise brown you're gonna get from xavier worthy so you know he is slender, though. He's a slight guy. He's small. And, you know, you get you take hits from monsters like Derwin James running over the middle. Uh, there could be some injury issues with him. He is skinny. But in terms of value, I think out of all those guys, uh, he, he he's a guy that I think he could be as high as a middle of the first guy or he could be a middle of day two guy. So I'm just not sure where he's going to land and what evaluators think of him. But I'm I'm going to be high on Worthy for sure. Who, who's your straight-up favorite of that group, not just best value? Keon Coleman, it is. Uh, I mean, look, I, I, you know, I watched a lot of Brian Thomas, and I watched a lot of Troy Franklin, and I wanted to have a different opinion. Uh, but Keon Coleman is just so good. He is so good. He can high point, I feel like, any ball. It's just crazy the catch radius this guy has. He's enormous and he's fat. Like, he is so big. And I'm watching, uh, I'm watching some film of him the other day. He's returning kicks and punts for touchdowns. Like, he's enormous. He's 6'4. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's Coleman for me. I don't know. I mean, you mentioned Roma Dunze good at contested catches because. He has to make a lot of them. No worry about the same thing for Coleman. I, there's obviously worry. Yeah, you, you do have to worry about that because there are some guys that come in and they come into the league and that's the thing, right? And and that's the knock on him. And that is why I was kind of like, you know, I keep seeing these mocks and Coleman's not going in the first. It's Brian Thomas over him. It's Troy Franklin over him. And I think for Fitz, you know, for Fitz to the team, sometimes those work better. I think one of those guys in Buffalo over Keon Coleman, I think works better, right? But... I, I think just in terms of talent, Keon Coleman's too good to be ignored. So, so Pat, uh, Bogman just took the words right out of my mouth. Any one of these names, you could see going to an awesome landing spot at the end of the first round. Maybe they don't all get there. I'm sure a few of them will be pushed to the second round. But you could make a case for the Bills, the Chiefs, the Ravens. Any one of these elite quarterbacks could be adding one of these guys at the back end of the first round this year. That's really enticing. Do you have a favorite of the group? Um. Yeah, so it's also Coleman for me too, and um, like I go and 
check on next gen stats and where uh, Mike Evans ranked in 2023 in yards of separation and uh, cushion rates and probably not top 25. I don't know offhand where he ranks there, but like I'm sure he didn't rank high in separation. Who cares? That's <clears throat> not Mike Evans game. That's the same thing with Keon Coleman. And you can see the Mike Evans in Keon Coleman's game and how he just like physically dominates the guys he's going up against. And oh, by the way, like Mike uh, Evans, Keon Coleman has a basketball background, played for Tom Izzo at Michigan State before eventually winding up at Florida State. So, um, yeah, like I love the guy. It's it's easy for me to see how he's going to translate to the NFL. And if people want to get hung up on separation, it's kind of silly. But, you know, I, I know some of the draft people I really respect, like Dane Brugler's got him like 28th overall or something like that, which sounds about right to me. I mean, I love him. I'd love to see him wind up with Patrick Mahomes, but knowing how much that organization cherishes speed, I think Xavier Worthy might be a, a more of a fun match for Patrick Mahomes. I And I think, um, you know, worrying about not being able to do one thing can be silly. Sometimes it's the thing that sinks a guy, right? But, like, people were worried that DK Metcalf was too stiff because he didn't do a good three-cone drill, right? Nobody cares about how he's doing a three-cone drill. He runs two routes, and he beats everybody. Uh, So, you know, that's... We can get hung up on the contested because it's not a joke. You know, the NFL corners are much, much better than college corners, uh, especially in the ACC. Right. So uh, that is no joke. But, you know, he makes so many contested catches because he boxes out. He has that basketball frame like Fitz mentioned. So I don't think that you have to worry about that too much for a guy of his size. And by the way, I was just going to say, Brian Thomas, I think, is everyone's consensus number four or or like the broad consensus number four here. Um, And I think he's terrific. Like, I've been very impressed watching him. But there's been so much talent in that passing game. It's hard to know how much of it is Jaden Daniels, how much of it is benefiting from playing with Malik neighbors. Like, that's the little hang up for me. No doubt he's really talented. But like, can he be his own man? You know what I Guys mean? Guys, like, Johnny Wilson over here. <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll move down and listen and get to Johnny Wilson in a second. But first, if you guys are anything like me, you have had plenty of terrible experiences buying tickets. I was going to a huge Maryland basketball game a couple of years ago. You know it was a couple of years ago because they're not having huge games anymore. <laughs> Just about everything that could go wrong did. There were hidden fees that raised the prices by an obscene amount. Not to mention it was difficult to tell if we could even trust the seller or how good the view would be from the seats. And of course, there were no available deals to make it just a little more affordable. Thankfully, that is never the case with game time. You shouldn't have to worry when buying tickets and with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, game time takes the guesswork out of the ticket buying process. I am on the app right now, and it stands out just how easy it is to navigate. My Wizards are actually in town tonight to face the Nuggets, and even though the team stinks, the ticket buying experience is awesome. It's so smooth. It's immediately clear which tickets are the cheapest, where exactly those seats are, and at the top of the screen, I can see flash deals to make sure I'm getting the best absolute price. Game Time is obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. They have deals on tickets right up to the start of the event, and even an hour after the event starts it's the place to find last minute seats where you can find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for basketball hockey concerts comedy theater and more with zone deals you pick the section and game time picks the seats for big time savings and the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and row for less games excuse me game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code FANTASYPROS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code F A N T A S Y P R O S for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Boggs, let's quickly wrap up with this uh, last group of receivers, wrap up on the receiver section. That is uh, Jalen Polk, Roman Wilson, Tez Walker, Malachi Corley, Jalen McMillan, Xavier Leggett, and Johnny Wilson. Any of those names stand out to you? 
I mean, all of them do. It's so funny when you look at this class versus last year because we would be – this is the third tier. We would be talking about these guys in the second round uh, last year and probably this year too. Um, Roman Wilson obviously made a huge jump for himself uh, during the Senior Bowl, so much so that he left practice on Thursday or Friday or whatever it was. So, uh, you know, another guy that – like McCarthy, they didn't throw the ball that much at, at Michigan, right? So there's less of what you'd want to see, but what you see is amazing from Roman. Um, Polk, I just watched, and I think I might have watched his best game. It was against Cal. He was unstoppable. He's uh, He just gets open very, very good against zone. And Malachi Corley, this is one of Fitz's guys. Um, and this is, you know, Debo Light. That, that's what everybody calls him. Uh, represents, you know, the same skill set as Debo. I don't know if he has the same talent level, but he is very good, too, and played at a smaller school, so a lot of guys don't know. Uh, who he is yet, but uh, Malachi Corley out of WKU is a huge name as well. So there's a lot of talent down here. We've got a TikTok up on the Fantasy Pros page about Malachi Corley as a, a sleeper wide receiver in this year's class. So everybody be sure to follow us there because we're going to have player profiles and underrated prospects all draft season long. Fitz, when I put together this list, you insisted that we add Johnny Wilson to it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He's just so big. I mean, he's like the guy who I think some fantasy platforms are going to have a hard time. They're going to have meetings over where to uh, what kind of eligibility to give Johnny Wilson, like tight end or wide receiver. He's going to be like Mar Marcus Colston was coming into the NFL, going to the Saints. So Not um, Yahoo. They'll just give him both. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> um, but what is he? He's like 6'6 six, six or 6'7. Six, I think they said he maybe weighed six, in. 6'7. Like, yeah, m or maybe measured in at like 6'6 six, six something at the uh, six, six senior and ball. change, right, yeah. Yeah, and just like this big dude, um, obviously major red zone potential, like Darren Waller is a comp that gets thrown around quite a bit. So uh, like I'd, I'd be much more excited about him as a tight end than as a wide receiver because like I don't think he's going to be a big explosive playmaker, but there is a lot of red zone touchdown uh, potential here. Who knows how accurate it is, but ESPN has 6'7", 237 pounds. It's a big <laughs> wide receiver. Big man. Got to use a, him like the Ravens do Isaiah Likely, you know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He can't play in line, but neither can Likely. So who cares? I'm curious. I'm looking it up now what uh, Likely's measurements are. I think he's 6'4", <laughs> 6'5". I don't think he's that tall, but he's very he, tall. He's he's 6'4", 235. So he is smaller than Johnny Wilson. Uh, at least according to you. And he's enormous. <laughs> yes, yes, he is not small. Uh, let's move to a far less exciting position this year. And listen, there are going to be names in this running back class that find roles, that maybe even are starters. There are guys here that people like, but there is no Jameer Gibbs. There is no B. John Robinson. There's nobody even within a tier or two tiers of what those guys would have been if they were in the same class. We talked about it when we were looking at our early running back tiers for Dynasty overall, not just rookies. We talked a bit about the rookies and said, there's probably going to be none of them taken in the first round of your Superflex, ro Superflex rookie draft. So it is a down year, no doubt about it. But there are still a lot of interesting names. I'll throw eight at you here, and I want you guys to pick ones that stand out. Blake Corum, Braylon Allen, Jonathan Brooks, Trey Benson, Bucky Irving, Audric Estime, Ray Davis, and Marshawn Lloyd. Bogman, do any of those names stand out as guys that you think could end up being NFL starters and therefore starters for your fantasy team? Well, first of all, Jonathan Brooks is the best running back in this class. I don't think it's really close, but he tore his ACL in November. So he's going to fall down boards. He's going to be off boards. And it's tough to say a guy coming in the NFL is going to look exactly the same because you're jumping a level and you're coming off an injury. So... He's going to be a little bit lower, but I got to shout out my Texas guy. But the guy that I like the most out of this group is Bucky Irving. And I, I it's a little surprising. Bucky is not the physical force that like a Blake Corm is or especially a Braylon Allen, but you can line him up anywhere. My dream scenario for Bucky, and I just did this in a mock with my buddy CK over at uh, In This League, uh, where I do a draft podcast over there. We put him in Philly in the second round. He was our first running back off the board. I just think the fit is perfect. Uh, he played at Oregon in the spread system, ran a lot of RPOs. He ran, a, he ran, he was in the slot. He lined up out wide at wide receiver as well. 
and he's electric with the ball in his hands. He's so super fast. So Bucky was the guy that stood out to me among all of the running backs uh, out of this group that you mentioned. Fitz, what do you think about any of these names? I mean, Marshawn Lloyd had a great senior bowl. People were buzzing about him Under after that. Underused at USC, too. Like, yeah, he's going to be a big name. Absolutely. I know, like, Audric Estime is says sneaky had like a really good career at Notre Dame maybe not so sneaky uh I know uh folks at the ringer really like Trey Benson I've seen football guys really likes Irving as well and estimate so like kind of depends like where you look you'll see different people who kind of I don't know if those are actually their RB1s in each of the sites but you kind of see different guys getting hyped up in different places that's kind of the nature of the class this year who's the guy for you Fitz yeah, so you would expect me to say Braylon Allen since I'm the Wisconsin guy. <laughs> yeah, you're good, um, you and- can pull a Bogman and just pick the guy. I, I, I don't have the luxury of doing that because there's no good Maryland players this year. So you guys need to be homers for me. But there's going to be, oh man, there's going to be a lot of excitement in a couple of weeks when Braylon Allen shows up at like 240 pounds and runs like a good time. I'm not going to make a prediction on the time, but I think it's going to be one that is going to have people really excited. Um, but like he is an early down thumper. And that's not necessarily the most valuable um, archetype of running back to have in Dynasty when Dynasty leagues are predominantly PPR leagues. And Braylon Allen, like, you know, he showed that he can catch a ball. He just can't do much in space when he catches it. He's not that kind of guy. For my money, the best pure runner in this class is Blake Corum. And that's hard because I I don't really love Michigan football, but uh, I see a lot of Ray Rice. When I see Blake Corum, I see a guy who's just like a resourceful runner. He can like for a a smaller guy and he's kind of overaged. Some so some dynasty managers are not going to like that small and overaged. Not a great combination for running backs. But man, he is so he's got uh, maybe not Devon Achan's contact balance, but he's got really good contact balance. Just a really good feel for finding creases. Um, I like him a lot, and I'm a big fan of Ray Davis from Kentucky, uh, a guy who showed run-catch versatility, and this dude is tough. Um, Just like the way he runs through contact reminds me a little bit of Josh Jacobs. Also, his personal life, not unlike Josh Jacobs. I think Ray Davis also experienced homelessness. So um, just a real good story and a tough kid, Uh, big fan of him. Yeah, these first eight, though, Like, there's not going to be much unanimity among dynasty managers in choosing which running back should go first. Like, there's going to be a lot of arguing in the the months to come about uh, how to stack this running back board. It's going to be very landing spot dependent. And everybody is to a degree, but this especially, this grouping is going to be who gets that day two draft capital, who goes to a spot where there's not an obvious starter, who goes to a good offense. That is going to matter immensely for these first eight, eight-ish names. There might be other names that kind of rise later in the process. Bogman, what do you think about Trey Benson? Because he's a guy that I've, a couple of people that I really trust in the space I've seen have liked him, and then I've seen others who aren't as high. What do you make of Benson? I didn't like him. He, I think he ran a little too upright for me, reminded me a little bit of Ronald Jones. So, I don't know. I just, there, there's a li- he has so much burst. He's so fast. Um, I don't know. I, he, I, he's going to be lower for me. It doesn't mean he's a bad back. And you put him in a landing spot and, in, in, you know, you lean him over a little bit. And now he's all of a sudden a much better back. So, you know, I think these things are fixable. But for a guy coming into the NFL, I was a little unimpressed. And I thought he was going to be my favorite after watching him at Florida State so much when I really dug in. I just put him a little lower on my board. I don't know if I'm going to have him much lower than five or six, right? But I, I, he's definitely not going to be one for me. So obviously we're not expecting any of these guys to be a first-round pick uh, in the NFL draft. Do we expect any of them to even be a top 50 pick, to even be a round two pick? I mean, it's hard to imagine two rounds going by without drafting a running back. But given the state of this class, given the state of how the position is valued, I mean, Bogman, where where is the first guy getting drafted? You know, you, oh, I'm not asking you to put a name on it, but where sure. is whoever the guy is going to be? I think it's going to be just right around 50. Before or after, I don't think really matters. I think it's somewhere late in the second round is where we're going to see the first one go. And, you know, I mean, like a lot of the teams picking, you know, when I'm going through it now, and obviously this is before even free agency has happened. It's hard to stick a running back, especially with all of the wide receiver talent and all the cornerback talent and all of that in the first couple rounds. There's a lot of offensive lineman issues in the NFL as well. So it's like you're, you either have better talent at different positions or more 
dire needs for some of these NFL teams. So, yeah, I think if, if I'm betting, I would say post pick 50. How about how about uh, Blake Corum to Jim Harbaugh and the Chargers in the mid to upper mid to early second round? I'd rather see Xavier Worthy there. But yes, uh, that is definitely a possibility. Um, and it depends on what Harbaugh chooses to do with that pick uh, at what is it? Six. So is that Joe Alt or is that uh, Brock Bowers? Is that a playmaker? Because if that's the case, you know, Harbaugh is going offensive line in the second round. Uh, but if it's an offensive lineman, then that leaves that spot open for quorum. Um, you know, obviously trades are going to work. Free agency is going to work a lot of those needs out as well. But uh, that landing spot would be amazing because you know that's exactly what Harbaugh wants to do. He wants to run the ball 60 times a game down your throat and never throw it. That's what he wants to do. It's what they did at Michigan, and that's what he did with the Niners too. He could maybe if, get quorum in the third too. It's maybe. possible. Yeah. If the Chargers didn't have Justin Herbert, you know that fifth pick would be J.J. McCarthy, the mm -hmm. way Jim Harbaugh <laughs> talks about him. Uh, we are talking about the rookies today, of course, but if you want an even deeper dive into all the twists and turns of the 2024 NFL draft season, our friends Thor Nystrom and Derek Brown have got you covered. They'll now be bringing you weekly NFL draft episodes right here on the Fantasy Pros Dynasty football podcast feed all throughout draft season. It is a brand new show. They just dropped the first episode on Wednesday. It was about their top 10 quarterbacks in this year's draft class. Spoiler alert, Debro is very high on J.J. McCarthy, maybe even higher than Jim Harbaugh is on McCarthy. Uh, definitely go check out that episode to find out why and hear the guys break down every position all draft season long. Sort of the back half of our, our top running backs here, Will Shipley, Cody Schrader, Isaiah Davis, Kamani Vidal, Dylan Loeb, Jalen Wright, Frank Gore Jr. Uh, Fitz, Jalen Wright is a guy that I've seen a lot of people tweeting about lately. Is he somebody that stands out to you as well? Playmaker, yeah. Um, I, I want to see what he runs uh, in Indianapolis. That That's going to be a big one, I think. Um, I like a lot of these guys. Shipley is interesting. Cody Schrader and Isaiah Davis, I know our, our uh, guys Thor likes. And I haven't seen much of Isaiah Davis at all because I believe he's the South Dakota State Jackrabbit. Is that right? Uh, yes. Isaiah Davis. So, um, you know, I, I like Cody Schrader. Um, carried a pretty big load for Missouri, but then again, so did Tyler Beatty, and he hasn't been able to get a, a foothold in the NFL. So, um, yeah, interesting group here. And that's the thing, like, we always see uh, day three rookie running backs pop as rookies. Like, one of probably one of these guys in the, like, 9 to 17 range is going to wind up being a 1,000-yard back. Like, it, it seems to inevitably happen, and, um, you know, this is just sort of an opaque running back class. Like, it is hard to see through the fog and uh, figure out which one of these guys are, are going to fire right away. Bogman, I think I saw you nodding when I mentioned Jalen Wright. Is he kind of a guy for you, too? Yeah, so in, in this group, I like Jalen Wright a lot. Um my buddy CK was like, you got to watch him. And I was like, okay. So I went back and watched him. He's very good. Yeah. Uh, so, and he's more complete. I think he's had, is it entry stuff? There's, there's some red flag about him. I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Um, but Kamani Vidal too, got a, a little bit of mention in a couple of podcasts. I was watching, I was looking at his stats, 94 missed tackles forced. And out of this group, that is the highest, as our boy Thor would say, with a bullet. Bucky Irving, uh, 69 missed tackles forced. And Bucky has the highest elusive rating on PFF out of all these guys. Um, Vidal is, I believe, fourth, fourth or fifth. And uh, Jalen Wright is third out of this group of 43 missed tackles um, as well in only 100, uh, 158 touches. Um, Bucky had 241. Uh, Kamani Vidal had 313. So all, all these guys are more complete backs. Isaiah Davis, too, complete back. I would put those guys ahead of Shipley, ahead of Schrader. I think those are passing down guys. And I think Will Shipley is smart enough to run inside. I don't know that he's big enough to run inside. So I think he's going to have to be a receiving back, a third down guy, an outside zone runner, something like that. I don't think he can keep it between the gaps. Fitz, I know you're no stranger to, wow, I'm so old moments, but I had one when I saw Frank Gore Jr.'s name for the first time as one of the first sons of a player that I vividly remember watching for multiple years. I mean, Frank Gore just retired like fan. three years ago. 
Yeah, well, yeah. Part, sun, part of that is Gore you know? just being so durable yeah. for so long, for sure. It, I mean, not that we're putting Hall of Fame career, you know, level type numbers on his son, but any similarities in their game at all? Not really. I mean, like Frank Gore Sr. was kind of like he was always pretty rugged and a tough between the tackles guy. Uh, Junior, I think, is like 5'8 and under 200 pounds. So they're not going to be the same type of back. Um, He's going to have to succeed in a different sort of way. Bogman, any interest at all just as, you know, the son of a great player? I mean, not not quite on the level of Marvin Harrison Jr. as far as juniors go in this class, but... Right, yeah. And by the way, Marvin, uh, he went in the Hall of Fame so fast, Fitz. He went in 2016, Marvin Harrison. Uh, So he went in so fast after retiring. It's crazy. Um, But yeah, look, Frank Gore, uh, uh, another guy that carried the load. I mean, he did everything for Southern Miss. So I am curious to see where he goes because, you know, uh, you can put him on special teams. He's going to give everything he has, right? He's just a heart player. So, yeah, I I think uh, I'm I'm at least interested to see where he lands. This wasn't a question I plan on asking, but just before we move off the running backs, in ter- as far as last year's running backs, because I mentioned there's no Jameer Gibbs or Bijan in this year's class. I- I'm curious, just at, you know, trying to rank the tops of classes in general year over year is always a fascinating conversation to me. Where would Bijan and Gibbs go at the top of Superflex rookie drafts if they were in this year's class? Like trying to compare, Ooh. was that just a historically good running back top of the class where those guys would be in the conversation with Marvin Harrison Jr. and Drake May and Malik Neighbors? Or is the position so devalued now, particularly in Dynasty, that nobody would be able to kind of break into that top half of the first round without being like generationally special? Fitz, what do you think? Dijon be third. Dijon mm-hmm. will be third. Yeah, I mean, I think he's still going ahead of Roma Dunze. I think, I, I think he'd go ahead of Jaden Daniels for me. Um, I think I would have taken him ahead of Malik Neighbors, not ahead of Harrison, not ahead of Caleb. I would have taken him third. Same. I think Boggs is what right. about what about Gibbs? Oh, behind and, Neighbors. Behind. Okay. Yeah. So it is still possible to have running backs up there, even in a really good class elsewhere. It just takes. Really special guys then. Yep. Yeah. All right. Speaking of very special talents, uh, let's go to tight end where there's only one name I want to talk about at the top. We'll talk about other guys as well. Don't worry, Bogman. We will get to your guy. I, but know, at, I, know, at, I know. At the top, you know, much like wide receiver and much like quarterback, there is a very clear number one. And in this case, maybe depending on how much of a homer Bogman wants to be, not that many players close behind him. Uh, it's Brock Bowers. I referenced him earlier. I want to ask right at the right off the top because there's no debate about whether or not he's he's tight end one in this class. Uh, is he tight end one of the last several years? Is he a better prospect than Kyle Pitts was coming out? Is he a better prospect than any other tight end you can think of? Because Pitts was had sort of the generational athlete you know label thrown on him by some people, but Bowers has been really productive since day one at Georgia. Bogman, what do you think? Ah, uh, um. I think I have Brock Bowers lower in my thought process uh, than Pitts, but I think it's because of Pitts and what he's done uh, at the NFL level. You know what I mean? So uh, Brock Bowers, to me, is the third best pass catcher in this class. I would put him behind Neighbors. I'd put him behind Marvin Harrison. So I'm still going to have him ahead of Roma Dunze, uh, depending on where Rome ends up right and where Brock Bowers ends up but I do think Brock Bowers is very good and I think it may be wrong to view him as a tight end he is just he is a tight end but he's a tight end in the sense that you know Mark Andrews is a tight end he's not doing a lot of blocking he is out there to be an option number one for a team that needs him like I could easily see him going to the Chargers, right, with that early pick. I could easily see him going to Tennessee. And in those scenarios, I mean, Keenan Allen might be a cap casualty. Mike Williams should be a cap casualty. And now all of a sudden you have nobody except Quentin Johnson and Joshua Palmer in L.A. So let's get him Brock Bowers. He could be a number one there. Is he already, would he be better than a fading DeAndre Hopkins in Tennessee? I think he would. So I think landing spot in terms of fantasy is going to be enormous for really any tight end, but Brock Bowers in particular, um, because he is that level of talent that will bump up against that insane wide receiver talent that we have. Um, but it's just, it depends on where he lands. And there's a picture floating around. Did you see the picture with him next to Gronk at the yeah. uh, Super Bowl? 
and he yeah. looks, you know, like someone begging for change next to Gronk because he's so skinny and Gronk <laughs> yeah. looks like a wrestler, you know. So um, well, I, I wanted to ask about that because Bowers is a little undersized for the position, right? And he's had some injuries. Yes. Yeah. So but you're not going to ask a guy of that talent. I mean, he may eventually switch to wide receiver. Uh, you're not going to ask a guy of that talent to block in the run game too much. You know, he will do his blocking that he should be, but you're not going to put him in line to block the monsters. He's not going to be blocking Miles Garrett yeah. or TJ Watt. He's going to be outside blocking wideouts. I, I think I referenced this quote when we did our uh, tight end tears episode, but I remember in the Kyle Pitts year, Daniel Jeremiah said, take tight end off of him just call him a wide receiver and he's the best one in the class now that didn't end up being true because jamar chase is in that class but right. is, it, it seems like it's kind of the same sort of thing with bowers where like just ignore the fact that he has te next to his name yeah. he's a top three pass catcher in the class do you agree with that fits that he would be ahead of odunze but behind harrison and neighbors if you grouped all the pass catchers together i think so i think that's where i'd uh, i'm would you have uh, had a neighbors fits because you, you know you were marvin harrison with a bullet more i don't think i could do it Okay. I don't think I could do it. But um, w one of the reasons I think uh, maybe Bowers has an easier transition to the NFL than Pitts had is because Pitts is sort of a get open against uh, mismatches, linebackers and safeties and, you know, make make the catch, make acrobatic catches in the end zone. Whereas I think Bowers is more the traditional tight end, at least maybe not in terms of blocking, but in terms of like taking a short pass and rampaging through defenses after the catch. Like that is where Brock Bowers just shines. Like he is a load to bring down, even though he's not Gronk sized, like he is just so nasty after the catch. Skinny so, shocky. Yep. And I mean, he reminds me a lot of Laporta in that regard, like a, a junior version of Kelsey in that regard. But I mean, like you saw it from the moment he, uh, set foot on the field for Georgia too in 2021. Like I saw the guy right away. I'm like, Oh my gosh, we have to wait until the spring of 2024 to draft <laughs> this guy in dynasty. Like it was in, it's been an interminable wait, And uh, I'm very yeah. excited that he's finally here. So obviously with tight end in particular, like team need in terms of your dynasty rosters is very relevant. If you have like Sam Laporta on your roster, you're probably more likely to go for, you know, a, a Roma Dunes or neighbors or whoever. Um, but Agnostic of that, if I, I like to try and put context into in actual rookie drafts, where are these guys going? Caleb Williams one, Marvin Harrison Jr. two, Drake May three, Neighbors and Daniels four and five, Bauer six, Odunze seven. That that's the clear top seven. Is that about the right order, Fitz? Yeah, I think that that sounds pretty good to me. Same. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I think that's the that is the order without context to your teams or these guys landing on teams yeah. yet or the combine. Because look, the combine separates, and it doesn't just separate, um, you know, the the good from the bad. It separates the good from the pretty good, you know, a, as well. So in a stacked class of wide receivers, you're gonna see a lot of separation from the combine. Same thing with running backs, even though the the uh, you know, the class is bad. You're going to see a lot of separation from the combine as well because the class, because they're all kind of clumped together. You're going to get a little more separation after the combine, whether that's because of numbers or what we just hear from GMs talking and rumors and stuff. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. So Bogman, let's say Brock Bowers is a, let's just say on a scale of one to 10, he's, he's a 10 out of 10 tight mm -hmm. end prospect. Jatavian Sanders tight end two in the class is a what out of 10? Six, five. Okay. Somewhere so there, like so that. there is a, a clear, clear Enormous. gap. Enormous. Yeah, look, yeah. I love is, is, Sanders. Is Sanders closer to Bowers than he is to tight end three, or is the gap so wide that Sanders, even though he's clear tight end two, is actually closer to tight end there's three. that money ball gap you know you know what i'm talking yeah. about like yeah there yeah. there's we're here <laughs> there's the rich teams there's the poor teams and then there's uh, and yeah. then there's the rest of the tight ends <laughs> that's what it is in this class it, it really is like um i mean you're gonna see a lot of separation uh, in the combine and tight ends because someone has to pop up outside of the uh, the top two here so i think there's an enormous gap between bowers and sanders and i love sanders um and there may not be that type of gap in production, but in terms of talent, uh, there definitely is. It depends on where Sanders lands. But the rest of these guys could all be never heard of again. And and I, in terms of fantasy, like obviously they're going to be on uh, sure. pro teams for a long time, but it wouldn't shock me if there wasn't another one to, to crop up their head and re have real impact in terms of fantasy, um, you know, beyond those top two. 
Fitz, what's your read on Sanders? Because if you look at our staff rankings, uh, you know, just sort by tight ends only. Debro has him tight end eight right now in, in Dynasty. Whereas you, me. And, you and Eric said are more like tight end 18, tight end 20. Yeah. Um, so obviously you're not quite as high as Debro is. Again, check out their NFL draft show for him and Thor to break that down. But what's your read on Sanders? Oh, man, I don't have a good one. And he's been one of my hardest guys to rank for like overall rankings in this rookie class. Like, I don't know where J- Jatavian Sanders really should go in super flex rookie drafts. Where do you think he belongs, Bogman? Um, in, in terms, so you, we're talking about in terms against the rest of the tight ends. Yes, in a twelve overall? team. No, no, not against the rest of the tight ends because he's clearly two. Yeah, I mean, is, is he a mid second round pick Bowers, in rookie and draft? He's oh, number three. Oh, okay, yeah. overall, I, I thought third. we were talking about uh, tight ends in the league. Um, yeah. Okay, so mm, late second, mid late second. second, late second. Uh, there's so many wide receivers, and I love Sanders. And maybe he'll have a bigger impact than a couple of those wide receivers that are low. But I can't take him ahead of Ladd. I can't take him ahead of Roman. Yeah. Um. You know, th- there are so many guys. There's a couple running backs still. I would take over Jatavian as well. And I love Jatavian. I think he's great. Um. But he is undersized, which is going to take him off the field a little bit more. Um. You know. Uh, Contessa catches he's okay he's not doing a ton after the catch I think he had four missed tackles forced uh the the rest of these guys um had him I'm mean, there are a couple guys down there that I I'm intrigued by but yeah I mean Sanders has got to what, be what round do you think he goes in in the NFL draft I think the second I think late second uh, he could push if he has a good combine I could see him pushing early second um, who, who, who goes higher Jatavian Sanders or RB1 whoever that is Sanders so uh, I, I, it, it really depends on who takes him, but I think tight end, and this is why you see Brock Bauer slipping down to like 15, 16 in a lot of mocks right now. Tight end is kind of becoming running back in terms of how the NFL views the position. It views it less and less and less, and it's more like, okay, well, I need a receiving tight end and I need a blocking tight end, not one complete tight end anymore. They're separating the jobs on the field, um, kind of like RBBC, right? Running back by committee, a lot of teams are going to. So the NFL is just changing the landscape of the position overall. So I think receiving tight ends, there's so many. So uh, teams are viewing them uh, less and less. But good combine, early second, bad combine, early third. I think that's what Sanders is looking at. Fits quickly to wrap up. Any other tight ends even worth mentioning? Kate Stover. I know Jaheim Bell has kind of a unique skill set for the position. But this is just such a clear one and, and clear two, really, that it seems like there's almost not worth wasting time in any of these other guys. Yeah, that's it. I mean, Stover, I think, made Dane Brugler's top 100 kind of near the back end of it, which, you know, could could make him a day three or a day two candidate. Um, Jaheim Bell... Interesting. I mean, I'm I'm kind of glad you mentioned him before the show that we should maybe talk about him, Worman. I agree because he's kind of like a typical for tight end and that he's sort of twitchy and quick. Um, so like maybe if he does something special at the combine workouts, he he could possibly vault himself into like late day two consideration. Um, but yeah, I mean, like this is a boy. It's a tough group to sort out after Bowers and Sanders. Wormley, yeah, what, what are you what are you missing Hayden Hurst? Is that why you like Jaheim Bell so much? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, I have I have Jaheim Bell in my campus to Canton League, so I, I watched him a little mm-hmm. closer than I might have some of these other tight ends way down. And he is, I mean, like Fitz said, and it's why I mentioned him, like just a unique a guy that can be used in unique ways. I he's not some star. He's not gonna I don't think he's likely to be a fantasy starter for you ever, really, but he's the type of, of player that I think an NFL team can take and find creative ways to use him, whether it's in the red zone, you can hand the ball off to him. I, th- I mean, again, I'm not saying I, I'm not going out on a limb here and like playing yeah, my yeah, flag yeah. on Jaheim Bell <laughs> or anything. He's just like an like H that. back. I, I think if, yeah. if one if one guy is going to jump up, I think it's Holker, the uh, Dalen Holker, the tight end out of Colorado State. Uh, I, I I think he got a lot of usage, uh, a lot like Trey McBride, you know. And I'm not comparing Trey McBride is way better, uh, but but I do think that this is a guy that could push himself into early day three uh, with a good combine and good. Meet meetings and stuff so i think that's a guy i know a lot of people like ben sanat as well uh, i think that he's a guy that can push himself up uh, already has the effort all, all that is there he's he's a high motor guy so there, there's talent there but it's separating it what it's going to look like and then how do the how does the nfl see these guys right um is a big big question and i think we'll get way more answers about that after the combine 
This rookie class is deep. It's fun. It's interesting. We gave you an extra 10 minutes on today's show to to try and get through as many names as possible. We will get out of here on that. And yeah, you know, if you're just diving in, you know, Super Bowl is over. Now is the time that you're sort of flipping the switch. This can be kind of an intro for you. If you are a diehard and have already been kind of in the weeds of these rookie drafts, this can be a snapshot in time here as we head into the combine. We'll, of course, update sort of rankings and tiers and stuff on the show throughout the next couple of months. But like I said, we'll get out of here on that. So for Fitz and for Bogman, I am Ryan Warren. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and sticking with us for 70-plus minutes. We'll see you again next week.